this. Welcome today to Iridology Education's presentation of Iridology Fact and Fiction, Myths and Fables, Where Does Fact End and Fiction Begin? Um, we are streaming this into a couple of Facebook groups right now, but I want to make this final announcement, and that is that we will, as of November 1st, I will no longer be streaming into the Facebook groups. In order to see the webinars, you will be required to use the webinar registration link. Right. And so uh, just letting you know in advance so that you can be prepared for that um, so that you can join us to learn more about iridology. My name is Judith Cobb. I'm a master herbalist, natural nutrition, clinical practitioner, certified iridologist and certified iridology instructor. I have been in the holistic wellness industry for four decades now. And in that time, I have studied many types of iridology. And what I'm going to share with you tonight or today, it's morning here actually, this morning, <laughs> is um, the iridology style that after all these years of trial and error and learning and studying and experimenting that I finally have settled on as being the style that works best for me. And actually I didn't finally just recently settle on this. This is um, about 30 years ago that I landed on this one and discovered that, oh my goodness, the difference for this between this one and everything else I learned was remarkable. I would love to know where you are joining me from. So I'd love it if you would get into the chat box and just type in where you're at. Um, it just helps me to know a little bit about who I'm speaking with. And I'd love to know if you've got any background in iridology as well. And if you do, I'd love to know what that background is. So if you would just get in there into that chat box and give me a little bit of love by telling me where you're from and do you have any background in iridology? All right. Let's dive right in. One of the things that um, is a perpetual story with iridology is the story about Ignaz von Petschle and the owl story. I've heard so many different renditions of this story that I no longer know what is true and what is not. It almost is not going to matter as you're going to see in a moment. The story goes that as an 11 year old boy, Ignaz in, I believe he was in Hungary, tried to catch an owl or a hawk or saw one that was trapped in a trap and he went to release it or whatever and somehow this and this bird had a broken leg and what Ignat saw was he saw a black line form or a black line in the owl's eye that as he took this wild bird bird of prey no less home to nurse it back to health he noticed that the black line disappeared and so now I don't know if it was a hawk or an owl. I don't know if it was a wing or a leg. I don't know what he actually saw. He was an 11 year old boy, but apparently he was a very astute 11 year old boy because he was paying attention to details, which is kind of cool. But we've got a problem with this because we've not been able to replicate this anywhere. You would think that with all of the wild bird sanctuaries where birds that are injured are taken to be nursed back to health and then released back into the wild, you would think that some technician or some veterinarian there would have seen a similar thing happen at least once and been able to document it. But we haven't heard any stories like that. And so Bill Caradonna says, modern iridology can't explain the owl's story. So uh, from very long ago, and it has not been reproduced. So it's just a waste of time to repeat it. It just creates confusion. Critical thinking is required when applied to any topic. Bill goes on to say, if you look at a picture of any owl's eyes or most animals for that matter, including um, four legged animals and other mammals, the structure of the iris is different from humans. There is no anterior stroma. When we look at eye photos, I'll show you what that means. Just, they just have a smooth posterior leaf without individual strands of fiber, so it is structurally impossible for such an event to happen. So when we talk about the anterior stroma, we're talking about the layer of the eye that has these threads in it. If you've seen a cat's eye or a dog's eye or a bird's eye, they don't have these fibers in the top. And so that means that, um, that 
what Ignat saw wasn't a separation in the fibers. Okay, so there, it was not possible. So there's a couple of things that we need to consider when you're on Facebook and Instagram and other social media platforms, you're going to find there's a lot of people posting before and after photos saying, I went on this cleanse and look at how my eyes have changed and look at, you know, all this stuff. And I was taught that originally, that's the old Jensen style. And I believed it. And I worked with that for 10 years and never once did I see an iris change the way I was promised it would change. So what we know is a couple of things. The first one is that when there is a pigment in the iris, it doesn't go away with cleansing. This, the irides are inherent. They show us the inherent potential. They show us where the strengths and weaknesses are genetically in the body. The pigment is also inherently programmed. And so it's not going to go away. These pictures are actually of the same client taken 30, 23 years, I can do math, 23 years apart. And people will look at these photos and the first thing they're gonna say is, wow, he must have done a lot of cleansing. Look at how much bluer his eyes are. Oh my goodness. And look at how much straighter the fibers are and look at how much smaller these markings are. That's amazing, that's good work. And what I'm gonna tell you is that's bohunk. Okay, that is not how we actually want to be interpreting this. And so, and I see we've got a hand raised. And uh, so what I'm going to ask is that if you've got a comment or a question, please type it in into the chat box. And we've got a hello, everyone. Excellent. Thank you. Okay. And so um, what we want to be aware of is that what's changed here is not this person's eye. It's the technology. This was a print film camera. I always shot Kodak film because what I noticed early on in experimenting is that Kodak film versus Fuji film, they shot very differently color wise and they developed very differently. And the developing company that I would take my pictures to, I didn't know how they had their developer set. So I didn't know how accurate the colors were coming out the other end. This is a 24 megapixel digital camera that uses an LED light. This is an incandescent flash. This is an LED light. LED tends to shoot blue and this camera tends to shoot more to the blue side. And so when we look at the color of the skin, when we look at the color of the sclera, we see a huge color difference and it's because of technology. So one thing we can monitor with these images though is the accumulation of pigment. And this is one of the changes that can happen. We can't cleanse pigment out of the eyes, but we can accumulate pigment over time. So do you see that in this image from when he was 42 years old to this image when he is 65, do you see this pigment that has accumulated? If you see that, give me a yes in the comments. Do you see this? Because what this shows is that his body genetically, inherently, was programmed to set this pigment in. And when we understand what the pigment means, what is the organ of origin? And when we understand what which organs are receiving the stress from the organ of origin being out of balance. Thank you, Linda. I appreciate you saying that you can see this. Thank you so much. This then tells us that as he is aging, certain organs are going, are struggling more and we can see also which organs are going to struggle under that burden. So we've got two organs to consider, the organ of origin and the organ of result or the organ of impact. And that's what this pigment placement is showing us. So we know that the irides do not change fast enough to monitor any changes in a matter of a few weeks or months. The sclera might, depending on how cute or chronic the problem was and depending on what the client did to help it out. So let's look at the sclera for just a moment. Can we see this Harry Potter? It's like a Harry Potter scar here. It's not really a scar, it's a blood vessel. But we can see that with time, it has become thicker 
and longer. So we know that that is telling us there is something going on chronically right now. Remember, the iris is genetic, the sclera is situational. Then when we look at this blood vessel coming along here, when he was 42 years old, this was much thicker. But look at the age of 65, something has changed, something has resolved a bit, and that blood vessel has calmed down. So we would need to do a sclerology assessment to understand what has he changed, what is, what is going on currently in the body. So again, these are actually my husband's eyes. So I get to look at his eyes every day, which is a definitely a wonderful thing. Um, but I, I see that we've got that tech difference in color. So we can't say this pigment has gotten lighter. We also see here, notice that the lighting that was used in this, this lighting is was not as bright. So the pupil was larger, which means that these trabeculae, as they are technically called, get compressed into a shorter distance, which means they have to wrinkle. They don't telescope, they wrinkle, which means that when we use a brighter light and that pupil is constricted, it stretches the fiber out, which means it also stretches out other markings so they look narrower but longer. Does that make sense? So this marking has not changed. We have not seen healing in these areas. What we have seen is a change in appearance, not in an actual change in his body, a change in appearance because of the how the light interacts with the size of the pupil and how the size of the pupil stretches out the trabeculae or makes them crinkle up into a smaller, a smaller distance. Does that make sense? If that makes sense, give me a makes sense in the comments box so that I know that this is landing well for you. So that's one myth. Eyes don't change as a result of cleanses and dietary changes. Thank you, Linda. I appreciate you saying it makes sense. The changes that we see, and this is when people post these before and after pictures, I always challenge them. I wanna see the before photos as well as the after photos. And when they do that, and they can't always do that because they often don't have the before photos. When they, when they do, I can always, and I, I'm not trying to be mean, I'm not trying to be rude, but I'm trying to help them see a point. The photos were taken under different circumstances, different lighting, different cameras, and that's so important, so important. I can even take my digital camera that I'm shooting with now, I can change the white balance. I can monkey with these photos and make them look just like I want them to look to tell whatever story I wanna tell, right? Or I could take these photos through like a Photoshop program and I can make them look exactly like what I wanna look. So we need to have integrity here. And I'm suggesting that when we have pictures that show before and after, that they're not using the same technology or as happened about 35 years ago, people who were publishing iridology books with before and after photos admitted to either using photos from different people, right? Before and after of what? You've got two different people there. They had really similar eyes, but they were different people. Or they admitted to using color filters to make the after pictures look like what they thought they would look like if they'd done a cleanse. So integrity is 100% of the law here. And if you're not going to have integrity and you're going to foist doctored photos, that's not serving anybody's purpose well, right? And we also need to, uh, um, to make sure that we evaluate, was the lighting the same? Were the camera settings the same? Was everything the same before we claim before and after and before we claim that there's been changes? Really, when I do iridology, I'm not doing it to change their eye color anyways. I had a long private message conversation with somebody who wanted to change his eye color and I'm going, not doable. Um, and, but you know, this isn't about changing eye color, it's about improving health. So I want to monitor what are my client's symptoms doing? I use the eyes to guide me as to what I want, as to where their strengths and weaknesses are, correlate that with their symptoms, then understanding all of that and understanding anatomy and physiology and nutrition and herbs, I am able then to create a program of what should they be doing next 
to begin improving their health or to take their health to the next level. Does that make sense? That this isn't about changing their eye color. If you're doing this to change your eye color, go get colored contacts. All right, so I want to share with you an example here of the, the myth of healing lines, you know, that healing lines appear when something is healing. Well, this is a case study done on myself. These first photos were done in 2017 when all was good. The, ro the world was rosy. March, uh, March 12th, 2019, I slipped on some ice when it was springtime here. And, you know, things melt in the daytime and freeze in the nighttime. And I was heading out early to catch public transit and didn't see the black ice on the sidewalk went down and broke two different bones in my wrist. Now, this area right in here is the arm area. Now, look carefully right in here. Two years ago, we see these very, these white lines. A week or five days, I actually had the presence of mind after having a double surgery to repair the arm, um, <laughs> had the presence of mind five days after this thing to take photos of my eyes. Do you see any difference? Do you see any difference? The fibers are exactly the same. Okay, so then I had the audacity on Mother's Day. So literally nine weeks, I think it was 10 weeks after this first accident to fall down some stairs and same arm, I broke the olecranon. That's basically your elbow bone. I broke it right off the bone. Oops, did not mean to do that. So same arm, wouldn't you think that after three broken bones in one arm, one double surgery and another surgery, all within 10 weeks, that we should see something in here, a black line that formed if we were following the bird story or something. Well, we didn't. We didn't. And then on August 5th, when the cast was off and my arm was just about as good as new, took some more photos, noticed my camera settings were a little bit different. I wasn't thinking quite as well that day, apparently. That's why we've got the color differences, but let's just look for, do we see any healing lines, any signs of trauma? No, we don't, none. So there's no black lines down here. There's nothing that says we will see healing lines. I can't tell you how many clients I told in that first 10 years, when you do the work, we're gonna see healing lines. We never saw healing lines. Not only were my clients disappointed, I was disappointed. I was starting to lose faith in what I was doing. And I was so grateful when I learned the constitutional style because constitutional iridology says there's no healing lines. And that made perfect sense to me. So you would think that considering what I own in here, I've now got two metal plates in my wrist with 12 screws and some wires and some pins in my elbow to hold that together while it was healing. You would think that when ha having something like that in my body, if the eyes were going to change, that there would be a change, but there isn't. There isn't. So that's just really important to notice. There we go. Get my mouse back. Okay. So healing lines is a myth. Healing lines is a myth. And actually, if uh, I just, just to humor, some people will say, well, really, did you really have surgery? I don't even know if you can see the scars. Um, that one's been crushed by my watch. I don't think you can see this. Can you see this little scar coming right down, right between these tendons here? Probably not very well. And then the other one is, well, actually you can see the plate. The plate's right here, right? That's kind of gross. And then again, on the elbow, you can see the scar coming down here. So yeah, I had three surgeries and you can see the plate right there. So you know it's in there, right? At any rate. All right, so Harry Wolf who is one of my mentors, love the man. He's direct, he's smart, he knows his iridology, his constitutional stuff like anybody's business. He and Bill Cardona were the two that were responsible for bringing uh, constitutional iridology to North America. He says uh, this concept of pigments equal toxins and you can cleanse them out. In fact, it's bogus at a dogma only found among some holdouts from the Lindlar, Kreitzer and Jensen schools of thought. 
The notion that certain metals, minerals, toxins routinely show up as diagnostic indicators in the iris has long been refuted and proven unreliable. There is no evidence to support the notion that heavy metal toxicity is measurable in the iris, likewise drugs, candida, etc. So the dark spots are again genetically predetermined, just like the overall color scheme of the eye, just like it was genetically predetermined that my hair would start to go gray seven years ago, right? Genetics, just like the crow's feet were genetically programmed, part, partially programmed and partially because I smile a lot. But this is, the eyes are genetic. Remember that eye, the eyeball itself is the largest neural receptor. It is one neuron to the brain. It's not a series of neurons, it's one. So this is the nerve, the end, the eyeball is the end of the nerve. And it knows what's, what the brain knew at conception. And that's why we see this stuff. It knows what was programmed. Oh, I love this one. The idea that you can see parasites in the eyes. Oh my goodness. You can't see parasites in the eyes. What we see in the eye rides is inherent genetic. The parasites don't change your genetic structure, right? The parasites don't change your genetic structure. And so you aren't going to see parasites in the brain, right? So we don't see parasites in the brain. We see these, which do not mean this person has parasites. What it means is a whole bunch of other stuff but nothing about parasites. And, and it doesn't actually give us a one-to-one -one correlation for anything. We need to see that sign in conjunction with some other signs to understand what impact this has on the person's body. Again, Harry Wolf says, American sources from the turn of the 20th century are very unreliable, repetitive, and very misleading with silly and debunked notions. I said Harry is direct. Like drug spots, sort itch spots, healing lines, parasite lines, and brown eyes turn blue with detox. Okay, so brown eyes aren't going to turn blue. Your hazel eyes aren't going to turn blue. Your green eyes aren't going to turn blue. Your eyes are the color they are because of your genetic programming, what your parents gave you. What we see in the eye rides is inherent. What we see in the sclera is earned and situational. What we see in the eye rides we don't change. We can't change. What we see in the sclera, we may be able to change if people are willing to do enough of the right kinds of homework. Is that all fitting for you? I would love to know again, how many of you have done, have an iridology background? And so just if you'd type that in that, yes, you do, or no, you don't, that would be great. Now, you, you're going to see this all over social media again, where people are diagnosing, you have blah, blah, blah problem, right? But here's the deal. A couple of things here. Number one, uh, only licensed medical practitioners are legal, legally allowed to diagnose. Iridologists, even if we are NDs or MDs, never diagnose from the eyes. And so... What I'm going to tell you is way back when I started studying iridology, back in the early 1980s, I studied with a first generation Jensenian student and we were taught we could diagnose from the eyes. We could tell people what was wrong. Funny thing is that I was usually, I was the one that was usually wrong. I would say your eyes say you have this problem and they'd go, no, I don't. Well, you have this problem. Well, no, I don't. And it got to be frustrating and annoying. Bill Caradonna says, iridology cannot be used to diagnose. It is a unique assessment tool to gain understanding of the blueprint of the body, including tendencies towards illness patterns or the assessment of resiliency and resistance against the negative influences. But diagnosing the presence or status of an illness or disease is never appropriate. We use constitutional iridology to guide us, again, to understand more about how the person's body is, is programmed to function, where their strengths and weaknesses are. We combine that with talking to the client about their personal health history and their family health history and what their symptoms and goals are with their health. And then we use all of that information 
to create programs to teach our clients about how they can achieve better health in the areas they are concerned about. In all of that, we never, ever, ever give a disease name. We never, ever, ever say we can cure someone, right? And so it's very important that we keep that in mind. You know, for the past several years, I've been teaching wellness practitioners like you the science of constitutional iridology. And the course is called Dynamic Iridology Assessment System for Holistic Health Practitioners. And it's the only live online fully mentored course for nutritionists, herbalists, and naturopaths who want to have this beautiful assessment tool to help them in their practice, to help them be uh, more laser focused, to help them be able to actually create programs more quickly for their clients. I find a lot of holistic practitioners spend a lot of their own time outside of client sessions when they're not actually being paid for their time creating client programs. And when you use this iridology properly, it can really help to, um, to streamline that process so you can create your client programs right in your client session. There's an info webinar happening on November 5th at 5 p.m. Mountain. Oh, we won't be daylight then. We'll just be st Mountain Standard Time. Won't we by then? Because we switched times this weekend. Mm -hmm. So um, where I'm going to share with you all the information about the course. So if you're curious about learning iridology and want to know what's involved and um, all the ins and outs of the course so that you can make a valid decision as to whether this is a good program for you, join me on November 5th. I've just posted the Zoom link in the comments box. So you can go ahead and use that link to register. The next course is starting on January 28th. And here's the sweet thing. Some of you are thinking that's a long ways away. I mean, that's three months away, November, December, January, my goodness. But I've got some very special perks for students who register early. And these are perks that the students who register closer to the date don't get. They won't get all the early accesses and things like that. So if you're interested in just getting information about the course, join me for the webinar on November 5th at 5 p.m. Mountain Standard Time. All righty. Now, I haven't seen any questions come in. Just wondering if anyone has any questions. Robin, it's so good to see you. And yeah, it, uh, great to have you following me again. And, and getting back into iridology. Any questions about anything we've talked about today, particularly about the idea of the myths that are out there? Where does fact end and fiction begin or vice versa? Anything like that? Churning around in your brain? All right. I'm not seeing anything come in. If, if you're madly typing and going, don't stop yet. Just raise your hand and I'll wait for you. But if I don't see any hands go up, going, going, gone. Thank you so much for being with me today. I hope you've gained something from being here and particularly a deeper insight on what the modern and scientifically proven iridology can and can't do and where the, the facts are with that. And hopefully I will see you again Thursday uh, the 5th, a week tomorrow, to learn more about the program. We will talk to you later. Bye for now.